Let's make our Bibles in John chapter 6. We're continuing our journey through the Gospel of John this morning. And we come to a tremendous passage of Scripture. I have a confession to make this morning. I, I love food. Do you? I think you probably do. I especially love good food. Our, uh, our home is filled with magazines like this right here. Paula D. Uh, I have stacks of these that they back. I probably have subscribed. Well, I was an initial subscriber to the Paula D. magazine when uh, she first started publishing it. So I've been a, I was kind of a charter member of the Paula D. magazine club. I have uh, magazines like this, uh, Food and Family. We also subscribe to Southern Living, Coastal Living, and other living magazines that are part of living. Uh, whether you're from the South or whether you live on the coast, every one of those magazines contains recipes. And as a result of that, I look cook. I have probably cooked, uh, prepared somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 Paula Dean uh, recipes through the years. I have probably prepared uh, uh, just about anybody on the Food Network. I have probably tried some of their dishes, whether it be Bobby Flay, Giada de Lorenas, I'm a garden, a barefoot contessa. Uh, I mean, you name it. I'm a, I'm a food network junkie. That's just, that's just who I am. And so, so consequently, I love food. Now, I try my best to not show the love for the food. Okay? I, I do try. I do try. Sometimes it gets the best of it. Sometimes my, my workouts at the gym uh, reduce my weight, and sometimes they just maintain my weight. Uh, depending on what I've eaten the night before. But I suppose that you are a lot like me. And that, uh, you know, I can remember a phrase that I don't hear it as often anymore, but probably uh, it is still around, and that is that I don't miss a meal. It's amazing as I put together my schedule and my calendar, I never have to write in breakfast, lunch, and supper. Never do. Never put it on there. It just uh, seems to come around automatically. I never have to make a special appointment. Uh, to eat. As a matter of fact, I would say that if I do nothing else in the course of the day, there are three things I'm going to do. I'm going to have breakfast, I'm going to have lunch, and I'm going to have supper. And more than likely, by the end of the day, I'm probably going to have a snack before bedtime. More than likely. And I, I just imagine I'm, I'm speaking to you this morning because you understand that. You know that 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 is is what it is what it is like. It's like it's like that for you. And the thing is, is that when I eat, I come away, or I, I, I say this, I sit down at the table with the anticipation that when all is said and done, the last morsel is off of my plate, that I'm going to be satisfied. I'm, I go and I enter that meal with the anticipation and the expectation that the end result is going to be satisfactory. My appetite is going to be suppressed. My empty stomach is going to be full. And at least for a little while, I'm not going to be hungry. But the thing is, is that with the food that I eat, whether I prepare it or whether I sit down to a meal that someone else has prepared, the amazing thing is, is that the appetite always comes back. It always does, every time, every day. I can eat before I go to bed, but when I wake up in the morning, what is the first thing I do? I get ready to eat breakfast. It's amazing how, how we're like that. And yet we live in a world today that even though I and you are probably very satisfied with uh, our eating habits and we're satisfied by what we eat and we have readily available to us basically whatever we, we desire to be. We live in a world that is increasingly hungry. We live in a world that physically there are more people that are, uh, that are starving than perhaps at any other time in history. Not only in, in third world countries, not only in places like Africa and, and Asia and other and places like that where we expect and have heard of hunger for years and years, even in America, people that are actually hungry, people that are actually malnourished, are, are increasing at an alarming rate. 
The other thing that concerns me is, is that not only do we have an increasing physical hunger, malnourishment problem in our world today, in our country today, we seem to have an increasingly spiritual thing in our world and in our culture. You know, when Jesus fed the 5,000 in the first part of John chapter 6, when Jesus performed that miracle, he was speaking to people, and he did the miracle for people who did not have enough to eat. He did the miracle for, for people who were many days malnourished. They were, they didn't know if they were going to have enough to eat. So perhaps that's why all four gospel writers recorded this miracle. When they didn't record all the others, this is the one that all four of them chose to put in their gospel story. It's because they, they understood, they saw the hunger on the faces of the people. They even raised the issue, even though initially, as Jesus performed this miracle, as the stage was set for this miracle, the disciples didn't have faith that Jesus could accomplish the miracle. Remember, their solution was, one, to, to send them home, to disperse the crowd and let them fend for themselves on finding the food. When there was no, no supply in sight, there was nowhere to go to get food, but then one of the disciples, Philip, said, let's just send them home. And then Andrew, when he did find a young man who had, who had been thoughtful enough, or perhaps whose mom had been thoughtful enough to take him a lunch for that day, when Andrew found the lunch, he did not think it was happening. He didn't see any solution in, into what Jesus was, was, uh, was going to be able to offer with that, with that one meal. And Jesus showed them what he did. After the feeding of the 5,000, the, the disciples left. Jesus went to the, to the mountain and the disciples got on the, got on the boat and they began to sail across the sea to the other side and the storm came up. Jesus saw them and came down and John tells us in his story. He says that immediately when they took him into the boat, immediately they were on the other side of the sea. God, Jesus took care of them. Well, when the dawn broke on the next day, the people were looking. I think it's significant in the fact that we know that we know that from the scripture that we'll read in just a moment, we know that the people did not comprehend initially what Jesus was trying to teach them with the miracle of the feeding of God. The they did not they did not comprehend the, the long term impact of what Jesus was trying to say to them. As a matter of fact, they entirely missed the point. You ever miss the point when you read God's word? Do we ever miss the point when we, when, we, when we hear God's word proclaimed, when we study God's word, do we, do we miss the point sometimes? I think, I think probably we do. So this is a story. This portion of the Gospel of John is one that you and I can readily identify with. We know what it's like to be hungry. Not to the extent that they were, but we know what it's like to have an appetite and, and desire to be, to be satisfied. We understand the fact that the cycle of life and its a part of it is, is that from one meal to the next, we go without, but then there's a need for more. We understand, we understand that, and, and we don't have any problem with that. When we look at this story, and, and I want us to pick up in, in, in verse, uh, chapter, in verse uh, 22 of John chapter 6. Look at what, what it says. It says, on the following day, when the people were standing on the other side of the sea, saw that there were no other boat. There. there was no other boat there except the one which the disciples had entered. And, they, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. And I think it's very significant there how detail-oriented the people were. They paid attention to everything. They were watching Jesus. They were not only watching Jesus, but they were watching the disciples to see, to see what they were going to do next. That's a very detailed verse. They, they had inventoried the boats that were, that were in the dock before anyone got into them. They, they, had, they knew the number of people who got into the boat to sail across to the other side. They knew that, they, that it was a group that was minus one. And they knew that the one that was missing out of the boat was Jesus. They understood that. They, they took inventory of what, of, what they, uh, of what they had seen. I think that's significant. I think it's significant as you and I, first of all, as, as we proceed in life, as we proceed in our walk with Jesus Christ, we, we sometimes need to pay a little more attention to detail. We 
sometimes we need to pay more attention to what is going on around us because the thing is, folks, is that just as these people were watching Jesus, just as these people were paying attention to where Jesus went and where the disciples went, did you realize that people are watching you and they're watching you? They're paying attention to you. It may be something as insignificant as something. Uh, well, Brother Craig wasn't in church today. People notice. Maybe significant, maybe a more significant thing is something that I do that I shouldn't do that people see, see me in a behavior, a pattern, or something of that nature. But nonetheless, people watch us. And they watch us with a, sometimes with a great deal of detail. Verse 23 it says, however, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread, after the Lord had given thanks. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into the boats and came to the prayer and seeking Jesus. They had seen a miracle. They had watched a miracle before their very eyes, before their very eyes. They got up the next day. They were looking for the ones that they had encountered the day before. They wanted, they wanted to be around Jesus. Albeit for the wrong motives, as we'll see in just a moment. They wanted to be around Jesus. They wanted to be around the disciples again. And they were curious about where they, where they had gone. They were curious about what had, what had happened to them. And so they ascertained and they surmised and concluded, well, the boat is missing. We saw the disciples get into it. They must have gone to the other side. So what did they do? got in their boats and they made their way across to the other side because they didn't want to, they didn't want to be away from them any longer than necessary. In verse 25, and when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come? In other words, Jesus, how did you do that? Jesus, how did you, we, we know you didn't get in the boat. We, we watched. We watched very carefully. We know how many disciples got in that boat. We know how many were in there when they when they pulled out of the harbor. But but Jesus, you were not one of them. And the thing that I that I want us to understand here, because as we'll see in the next verse, Jesus is not going to answer their question. Look, look at what he, what Jesus says in verse twenty six. It says, "Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the sun." But because you ate of the loaves and were fed. This is, this is really where our, our sermon begins. This is our first point today. Jesus gives us a warning about missing the bread of life. He gives us a warning about missing the bread of life. And, and the first thing he shows us is, is that we may miss the bread of life because we may have a curiosity without any commitment. We may have a curiosity without any commitment. Certainly these people were curious about how Jesus went from one side to the other. I don't know. Jesus is Jesus. I, how he got there, I don't know. I don't know what mode of transportation he might have used. But anyway, nonetheless, when Jesus got in the boat with the disciples, we know he arrived on the other side with them, but they just arrived there. I mean, that's what John tells us. We, we just, Jesus got in the boat, and the next thing we knew, we were on the other side. I mean, that's, that's all John says, and that's enough for me. I'm not going to question that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how it was that Jesus got that boat to the other side. And that's what Jesus tells them in verse, 20, in verse 26. That's what he tells them. He says, most assuredly, that's Jesus' verily, verily, truly, truly, I'm reading out the New King James Version this morning. Jesus says, you can't argue with me on this. This is a, not a contradictory subject. You can't contradict me on this. And, it, and then he pinpoints, he says, this is why you're curious. Not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. You ate the loaves and were filled. Jesus had filled their stomachs. Jesus had done a, a tremendous miracle before they did their very eyes. But I think Jesus, Jesus, Let's be reminded, folks, this morning that when Jesus looks at you and me, he looks at us inwardly, not outwardly. He knows what's going on in our hearts. You can't fool him. You can't pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. You can't, you can't pretend. You can't, 
Uh, you can be fake. I mean, Jesus knows you inside and out. He knew these people, and he, he looked beyond them. He saw that they, they, there was, a, there was a, just a curiosity question. Jesus, how, how did you do that? Jesus says, that's not really, that's not what I want to, want to talk about. And Jesus, when you read the Gospels, you find when, when people ask questions just out of curiosity, and Jesus sees their hearts, he doesn't deal with spending time answering that question. He moves on to the, to the more important thing. You came, you saw this view. You came to me not because you saw the signs, but because you came to the loaves. And you know, there was curiosity without commitment. He also sees the fact that there is superficiality without comprehension. Superficiality without comprehension. And what I mean by that is, is that they, they looked at what Jesus had, had done, knowing, knowing what he had done. And, and the reason that they followed him, and Jesus did this, was because they had, they had full babies. Now remember the people have, they know what it's like to be physically And when, when Jesus did this miracle, they saw it as an opportunity. Hey, if we can keep up with Jesus, if, if, we, can, if we can stay close enough to him, if we can follow him wherever he We'll never have to worry about our food. In other words, he did it once, but he did it. That's, that was their motive. That was their, and, and let's face it, we all, let's face it, we, no matter what our work ethic is, you know, I, I was called and raised as a child just like many of you, if not most of you. Or, you know, nothing is for you. You don't do many things just because that, that you're going to get something free from it. But, you know, not everybody operates by that principle. So if someone's not operating by that principle, if someone is not, does not have the same work ethic and the same desire to earn what I get and, and, the, and the pay my own way and, and those sorts of things, if someone doesn't have that and they get a handout and a freebie, they, it's easy for them to continue to you did it once for me, maybe you'll, maybe you'll do it again. And so the people that were following Jesus on this day thought, you know what? We got a free meal out of this. We can't even gather with Jesus. And he did it once. Let's follow him across the sea. Let's go over to Capernaum. And you know what? They were thinking, I bet he's going to do another miracle. Maybe it'll be another food. And you know what? Maybe after that, we'll Jesus is trying to point out to them that they were missing. Jesus was trying to point out to them the sign of miracle that I did had much more meaning than the fact that, that your bellies were full of this. I mean, it goes to, to love. It goes to, to us. We, we can easily make application in our lives as when we come to church. Why do we, why do we come to church? What do, we, what do we expect? You know, when we sit down to a table for a meal, we, we come full of expectation. We, we have expectation of the end result. We know what's going to happen. Do we do that when we come into God's house? Do we do that when we go to something else that may be spiritually uplifting, such as a Bible study, a Sunday school class, a worship service? Do you come? Do we come and sit down at the table and in our time together with God in God's house, do we come with an expectation? Do we come that, with the expectation that when we leave, we're going to be satisfied, that when we leave, we're going to be full, that when we leave, we're actually going to be taking something with us? Or do we miss the point sometimes? Do we miss the point sometimes when we come with superficiality without comprehension? If all we do is come with curiosity, if all we do is come with... Um, with, with a superficial motive, not, even, not expecting that we're going to get anything deeper, not anything that, that goes beyond the surface, that does nothing more than scratches the surface of my mind. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to leave this one. 
Because Jesus always wants to do more than that. Jesus never just wants to satisfy your curiosity. Jesus never just wants to scratch the surface of our life. Jesus, every time when we, when we read in the Gospels, when we read what Jesus does, remember, remember the, the theme of the Gospel of John is, is right up here, that you may believe. So everything that Jesus does in the Gospel story, especially in the Gospel of John, most especially in the Gospel of John, every time Jesus does something, it is to move us toward a deeper belief and a deeper relationship with Him. So it stands for reason that every time you and I gather together as a group and we come to meet Jesus, we come to experience His Spirit and the Spirit of His presence and in a place and in our hearts and in our lives, we know that Jesus' is, Jesus is intent is that in the end, we're going to leave here more satisfied. We're going to leave here in a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Him than it was That's what Jesus does. And then Jesus goes on, and there's, there's another thing. Look at verse 27. He says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal upon you. What Jesus is saying there to the, to the people that have he says, all food, all food that, that you eat, no matter, no matter what it is, it's all possessions, all the things that, that you have are going to lose their sustaining power. They're not, they're not going to fulfill you over the long haul, is what Jesus is saying there. So he encourages them to eat of the food that will lead to everlasting life. Jesus is trying to help him to see that while you guess you may have a physical hunger, there is a deeper hunger that is embedded in your life that I want you to realize. And that is a spiritual hunger. And Jesus wants them to know that he is the one who can do that. I'm the breath. I'm the one who can. I'm the one who can do that. So, Jesus is saying, don't just come with curiosity. Don't just come with superficiality. Don't just come with this materialism, this desire for materialism, food, things. Don't just come with that. Come, I want you to understand you've got a greater than me. You've got a greater than me. Some of us may have come into this place today and believe that everything was fine. Everything's okay. And, 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 and on the surface at the knee. But when we come to God's house, when we come into God's presence, and when, when we are exposed to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit works on our hearts and minds and He reveals some things that maybe we didn't realize were there. We have the opportunity to do something about it. So Jesus warns about missing. You can miss it. You can miss the bread of life if all you have is a curiosity, if all you have is superficiality, if all you're concerned about. It's the material, the physical, the spirituality. You can miss it. Then he, then he comes back. And he talks to us about having the bread. He instructs us about, about having the bread of life. Look at verse 28. Then, then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, all right, you're talking about this deeper stuff now. We want to be able to do what you We want to be able to do what, what you can do. And Jesus answered them in verse 29, and, and he said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. People believe that, first of all, they believe that as Jesus spoke to them about the bread, he didn't speak to them about the bread of life. They, they believe that it's about their performance. A lot of people start out that way. They believe it's about what, what they can do. And, and, human, and people that have a faith or a belief system that is based on human performance are always going to ask the question. And, and essentially what the people are saying here is, is, is Jesus, what can we do to vigil? That would do the job. What can, we, what can we do over and over and over again that will meet those requirements? What, what can we do over and over again that, that will meet, uh, fulfill us in our in our lives. Lord, you know, is it, I mean, 
you can imagine what's running through their minds. Is it sacrifices? Is it is it offerings? Is it is it is it ceremonies? Is there particular ceremonies that we can do that would honor you and, and would meet your performance standard and, and so that we would so that we would measure up, that we would be fulfilled in our in our lives? And Jesus tells them, Jesus tells them in verse 29, he says, There's nothing you can do that will ever measure. He says, This is what you can do. This is the work of God that you believe in Him and He's See, Jesus gets to what he's really asking them is, do you believe in him? Up to this point, they believe in his miracles. They believe in his ability to provide food. But Jesus now gets to the heart of the matter. Do you, do you really believe in him? They wanted it to be about human performance. Jesus says to them, he starts talking to them about, about the And he tells them that, that, that spiritual life does come from an abiding faith. That's what he's talking about there in verse 20. There's an abiding faith. You continue, you believe in me, and you continue to believe in me. It's not multiple works. It's not all this ritual stuff. It's not the stuff that you do over and over again. Your attitude comes from your continuous belief in me. This is, this is who I am, Jesus says. This is my mission. My mission is to, is to help you to be fulfilled in ways that you didn't realize that you had a need to be fulfilled, but I'm the one who can, who can fulfill it. And Jesus is trying to get them to understand he's more than food. He's already told the woman at the well, whoever drinks of this water will, will thirst again. He's talking about the water in the well. He says, you know, you're gonna, if that's all you can, then you're going to have, you're going to continue to be thirsty. If, 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 if all you want is the bread that I can multiply from a little boy's lunch, if that's all you want out of this, then you're going to continue to be hungry. It's not going to satisfy. And so Jesus tells them, he says, it is, if you want to be satisfied, you must But he goes on. Look at what he says. Look in verse 3. Therefore, they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What, what work will you do? I mean, really? Really? Are they serious? I mean, are, are, they, are they really serious? And then he goes on, verse uh, 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to me. We, we know what happened to our fathers. Will you do that? Will you do that for us? Verse 32. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread, the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. These people wanted to find faith in miracle monger is what they wanted. They thought that spiritual life, you know, it's just one miracle after another. Jesus, you did this, and this, and we know what, what Moses did is they, they, they gave Moses the credit for the man in the wilderness. We know that this is what had happened. We want you to do something else here for us. We want you to, to do another miracle. And Jesus says that's not the that's not the answer. It is not found in, in, in miracle mongering. That's, but the crowd, I mean, you would think that Jesus would have done enough to convince the crowd. You would think that Jesus had, had certainly made his point with his, with his dramatic miracle. He didn't. But Jesus knew that they would not believe in another miracle of him more than they did the first. Jesus knew that that, that, that was not.
when you came into this room this morning, you you were intensely hungry. You came in here with the full expectation that God was going to speak to you. His message may be for you today that He is He is who can both be. And I'm going to read the remainder of these verses. Jesus says down in verse 40, it says, But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe the bread of life. The one that was sustained you forever is standing right here before you, but you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should not lose, that I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me. And everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have eternal, may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. You see what Jesus is saying there? After He says He's the bread of life. Look at the, the remainder of His discourse. There. He says, I, those that the Father gives me, I lose none. He's talking about security. He's talking about once you believe in me, once you believe in me, you're going to be kept. I'm not going to lose Him. Once you believe in me, you're going to have everlasting life. The ones who believe in me, the ones who accept me are going to have be raised up in the last day. Jesus proceeds to tell them about all the benefits of having the bread of life. You want this bread continue to, to be given to you? This is what, when you accept me, the fact that I'm the bread of life, Jesus says, these are the benefits. I will never lose you. I will never cast you. And I will raise you up. That's what Jesus says. That's what Jesus says. And, 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 and what Jesus is trying to get them to realize is, is that, hey, all, and all you're asking me for is another barley loaf? All you are asking me for is some more sardines? That's all you want from me? You really think that that is going to be what is going to sustain you and satisfy you for the remainder of your days on this earth? They didn't understand that Jesus was here only for a temporary time. They didn't understand that Jesus had been sent here on a mission from God. They didn't understand what his, his purpose was. And Jesus is trying to let them know, just as he did the woman at the well. She said, if, he said, if you drink of me, you will never thirst again. He says to the people that he's speaking to on the other side of the sea, he says, if you will accept me as the bread of life, I'll be your sustenance. I will be the one who keeps you. I will never cast you out. You will never be hungry again. Let me just say it's a word of personal testimony. I have sat down to every meal that I have ever eaten and was satisfied momentarily but only a few hours later to be hungry. But can I tell you that Jesus, Jesus satisfied my spiritual need and my spiritual hunger when the first when he first came in. The only hunger that I have is to be more like Him. The only hunger that I have is, is, to, is to live my life stronger for Him. To, be, to grow closer to Him. That's my hunger. Jesus needs to do nothing more than what He did on the cross for me. And when He was raised from the dead and ascended back to the Father, and He prepared a place for me in heaven, He needs to do nothing more for me than that. Every meal that I will eat, I will always be hungry. Never did anything more than what Jesus Christ did for me. Ever. He satisfied me fully. He is. See, you're bread of life. Are you here hungry this morning? Did you come into this place with a hunger in your heart? Do you need to eat the bread of life? You got it this morning. I ate some breakfast, drank some coffee this morning, but if you go out of here and you see a dove what are you going to do? You're probably going to go get that one. You're going to go get another cup of coffee. Because maybe one more, one more will sustain you until you have to leave here and go get a bigger cup of coffee. But I want you to know this morning, you come in here today and you're, you're, you've got a spiritual void in your life. There's an emptiness in your heart. There's no donut, there's no cup of coffee, there's no piece of cheese. Anything like it that will satisfy you. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. Heart. 
If you're here this morning and you're a believer, and you're not where you need to be with Jesus, you haven't been, you haven't been growing in him, you haven't, you haven't let him do what only he can do, and that is to, to really dig you up and show you more and more like him. And I walk him with him like you should. And we need to bring him into life. If you're here this morning, you're looking for a place to belong, you're looking for a church to say, This is our church, this is my church. I have a been fulfilled and, and perhaps somewhere else and God's leading me here. This is where he's fulfilling me. This is where he's leading me. This is where he's meeting your need for fellowship, where he's meeting your need for the study of God's word. This is where 